Hi, everyone. So the, uh, yeah, good morning. I'm the uh, second part of the first pair of speakers. <laughs> I had to, sorry. So the, the title of my talk is, uh, Where Would It Be, be Without the States? Um, and uh, it's sponsored by Steve and Cassandra Torello. Thank you so much. I think when, when you pose this question to people, regular people outside of this room, uh, you would get sort of the same answer. It would look something like this. <laughs> so without the states, yes, we might be in the future, but we might, we'll also be dead and AI will have killed us all. Uh, we would lead solitary, nasty, brutish and short lives. And that's basically the end of it. So the state has saved us all from ourselves. If you ask people in this room, I think you would get a, probably a different vision, a different answer. Uh, that different answer is going to look something like this, I hope. <laughs> I think this crowd is old enough to remember the Jetsons. The question, though, when you have these two different answers to the same question is, which one is actually right? Which one is more correct? And how can we know which one is correct? And I'm going to take this, this opportunity to prove to you that we can know and that sound economics provides the answer. It tells us which vision is actually correct and which answer is correct to the question, where would we be without the state? In a sense, what is the impact of the state? And specifically, I think looking at entrepreneurship and the role of entrepreneurship in the market will help us to uncover what would actually be the case, what would the world look like had it not been for the state. So if we dig into entrepreneurship, I'm going to lean on an authority here, uh, Louis von Mises. And he notes that entrepreneur is used uh, in a specific meaning, praxeologically speaking. It is acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. This is very broad. It just means that whatever speculative component there is to any action is entrepreneurship. So when we go uh, out after my talk and have coffee, that action is entrepreneurial to the sense that we are unsure about the result of going and getting coffee. That's not very helpful when we're looking at what, it, what does the market look like, because we all act all the time. Uh, so this broader sense makes sense. But it's not really the driving force of the economy. And that's where I want to focus. And that's, of course, what's going to uh, lead to us being able to answer the question. So Mises has a different definition of the entrepreneur as well in human action. It says that the driving force of the market, the element tending toward unceasing innovation and improvement, is provided by the restlessness of the promoter, his term for what we would generally call an entrepreneur, and his eagerness to make profits as large as possible. This is entrepreneurship in the narrow sense. Okay, so what does that mean then? What, what, what is the promoter? And what does the promoter do? Uh, in economics, of course, we're talking about the function and not the person itself. So anyone can be or become a promoter in the economy. Well, what do they do? Promoters are the leaders on the way toward material progress. They are the first to understand that there's a discrepancy between what is done and what could be done. They guess what the consumer would like to have and are t intent upon providing them with these things. OK, so how do they do this? Well, they imagine what is possible, and they imagine what consumers will value in the future. So they have this idea. This is, they're inspired by something to come up with oh, I think consumers of a certain type in a certain situation in the future will be much better off from my producing this for them. And of course, they're going to be inspired by what is around them, what others have done before, things like that, in order to create the next step. It's not just a tiny step forward. It's probably something disruptive that's going to change things up quite a bit. Uh, and there's a famous quote by Henry Ford you can't really ask customers what they want because they don't really know. And Henry Ford supposedly said that if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, which is not a solution. It's not even possible, I think. Um, 
But an automobile will, will uh, help people much more than a faster horse to, uh, in terms of personal transportation. So this vision, following that vision, and really disagreeing with customers themselves is how we got into, well, urban sprawl, I suppose, but how we got to an automobile-based society it was thanks to Henry Ford creating the affordable automobile. Okay, so what do they do after they imagine that they can create this new thing? Well, of course, they invest in and they put together the production structure, the production process of this new thing that hasn't really been tried before, and they try to figure out how to best uh, satisfy consumers in this future situation that they're aiming for. Then, of course, they start production. Uh, they try to make it a reality using whatever technological knowledge there might be and whatever engineering skills there are, hiring the right people, the right experts, and so forth, combining materials, combining expertise, combining whatever there is. And then as a result, they present whatever it is they're producing to the consumers, and the consumers decide yay or nay. They either buy it or they don't at whatever prices are necessary to cover the entrepreneur's costs. This, of course, is consumer sovereignty, as someone mentioned yesterday, um, where consumers get the final say whether to buy something that is offered in the market. And entrepreneurs stand or fall with consumers' decision. Now, I have elaborated on, on what the promoter means and what Mises meant with the promoter in a, in a somewhat recent article in, an, in the excellent journal, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, published by the Mises Institute and edited by Dr. Salerno. Uh, so check that out if you're interested. The way I usually put this, though, is that there is an entrepreneurial calculus that helps us understand what is successful entrepreneurial action and how, and what, is, what are the implications of this. And I use three words to do that. So value is greater than price, which is greater than cost. What that means, of course, value is in the consumer's eyes. So value is what the entrepreneur is aiming to create. It's the, the satisfaction of, of the consumer in the future. The price is what the consumer is willing to pay for that thing. And the cost, of course, is whatever the entrepreneur has assumed in order to produce the thing. This gives us um, two insights immediately. One is the consumer's profit, the value minus the price, is what makes it sellable. And of course, the greater the discrepancy, the greater the profit for the consumer, the easier it is to sell. So offer something of enormous value at a low price, and the consumer will not be, uh, you don't need to push the consumer very much for the consumer to actually make the purchase. This is psychic profit for the consumer, because the price, yes, it, it, it is in money terms, but what really matters is what else can you buy with this money? So what other satisfactions are available? Then, of course, there's the entrepreneur's profit, the money profit, which is the price that the consumer has decided that they are willing to pay for the good minus the cost of producing those very goods. And whereas uh, I came up with a value uh, greater than price, greater than cost, I'm not alone in this. So Mises agrees uh, with this uh, uh, way of putting it. He says, there's nothing automatic or mechanical in the operation of the market. The entrepreneurs, eager to earn profits, and it means the promoters here, uh, appear as bidders at an auction, as it were, in which the owners of the factors of production put up for sale land, capital goods, and labor. The entrepreneurs are eager to outdo one another by bidding higher prices than their rivals. Their offers are limited, on the one hand, by their anticipation of future prices of the products, as the price that consumers are willing to pay, and on the other hand, by the necessity to snatch the factors of production away from the hands of other entrepreneurs competing with them. And this is, of course, what, where the prices of the factors of production come from in the whole economic calculation uh, process. He also says, here we go, that the fact that a project is not profitable because costs are higher than proceeds is the outcome of the fact that there is a more useful employment available for the factors of production required. So if the entrepreneur has bid too high for the inputs and therefore cannot cover their costs, those inputs could have been used better elsewhere. Or to put it very uh, much more 
in the metaphor punchy language, profits are the driving force of the market economy. The greater the profits, the better the needs of the consumers are, are supplied. He who serves the public best makes the highest profits. That's the, the law of the market. That's how it works. Now, to this situation, if we add the state, what happens? OK, so this is a downer, I know. But. <laughs> so the state primarily acts in the economy in terms of regulations. And regulations are restrictions. They're imposed, and they're enforced, and they're the whole purpose is to cause a change to what is being created in the economy and how it's being created. Uh, so these are, are forceful limitations and restrictions placed on what can be done, how it can be done, when it can be done, and by whom it can be done. That's what regulations are. Of course, there's also taxes, and taxes are a financial burden overall, which makes everything less profitable, which makes it harder to cover your costs. OK, so what does this mean then, adding the state? Well, it means that entrepreneurs trying to make a profit, trying to make as much money as possible by satisfying consumers, if there is any kind of restriction in place that affects them at all, or their imagination at all, that means they're going to pick something else. They're going to go for something that is not what they otherwise would have chosen. That, of course, means that it's going to be something that they consider to be of lesser value. Because if they're not restricted, they would chose, choose the highest value they could think of and that they think is reasonable. So the obvious result is that, well, entrepreneurs will create less value than otherwise would be the case. Uh, and that, therefore, consumers will be served to a less, lesser extent uh, than in the free market. It also means that because they pursue those lesser valued options, they're investing in those types of production. So they're investing in producing things that are not as valuable to consumers as they otherwise would have chosen to uh, invest in. Which means the whole production apparatus is then shifted towards producing less value. Which follows pretty easily, I think. Of course, only to the degree that this is allowed by policy. So, Assuming a world where there are more than one regulation, might be hard to uh, imagine, perhaps. Uh, you could imagine that maybe entrepreneurs are affected and limited and restricted by a, a lot of different rules and regulations and red tape and so forth. So they're not picking the second best option, but they might be picking the 99th highest value option. And therefore, you have the investments in productive capability along those lines rather than the highest valued option. The only reason the entrepreneur does this, of course, is because they're following the policymaker's restrictions rather than the consumer's actual will. So in a sense, a regulation is a way of replacing consumer sovereignty with policymakers' power and the bureaucracy and the enforcement of these regulations, which is also something that we, we know. Now, this means, of course, that a lot of these types of production that otherwise would take place remain unrealized. So whatever entrepreneurs imagine that they could have created for entrepreneurs in generations, building off of what was before and all those discoveries, they will simply not come to be. And this unrealized, I think, is an uh, important addition to the seen and the unseen, because it's a long-term effect on our standard of living. And I, I talk about this in, in my book, The Seen, the Unseen, and the Unrealized. And I think there are some copies left uh, at the book's table, um, where I elaborate on what is the actual extent of the impact of regulations on the economy. And it is quite a bit of an extent. So the question then, of course, is how does this help us? Where would we be without the state? What, what is the state in terms of its regulations and everything it does to the economy and in the economy? How does this uh, change things up? Well, I, I managed to get a picture from a different dimension um, where there are no regulations in place. And I got a picture from uh, New York City. Manhattan, 
taken today, but in this other dimension. And it looks something like this. <laughs> and I don't think this is an exaggeration. I'm not sure for how long this has been a free market either, but I think that we can say that because of these restrictions, because of these limitations imposed upon entrepreneurs, and therefore their investments in a non-maximizing imagined value for consumers, we're going to be at a lower trajectory overall and have been for as long as there have been regulations, which is quite some time. And therefore, we've lost out every investment, pretty much. We lose out in terms of value creation and therefore standard of living. So this is probably um, an underestimation of where we would be. Uh, so let that sink in. I think there's, uh, in terms of just looking at entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial function in the economy, we can easily see where we are versus where we possibly could be, the potential of where we could be. And therefore, I think the, uh, where would we be without the state is easily proven that we would be definitely be better off in terms of economics, in terms of the market, in terms of standard of living. Thanks so much.